You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. This session features Steve Braunius, Emma Neal, Tay Tibble and Chris Teese in conversation with Cliff Fell. Kia ora koutou. Good afternoon. Welcome to Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks and the Friday Poem Session. My name is Kerry Sunderland and I'm the coordinator of the program and I'm really delighted to that this session is happening this afternoon. Um, it was actually, is Jaquetta here? No. She, she came up with the idea and contacted me, I, I think it was last year sometime, I think it was in consultation um, with a conversation with Steve that happened last year sometime, is that right? Steve? Yeah. And I went, what a brilliant idea. But at the time, we didn't have a Friday to do it on. And I just thought it was really odd that we'd have a Friday poem session on it any other day. And then we decided to make um, this year's program over four consecutive days. And I went, yay, we have a Friday. So here we are. I'm so glad you came along. So um, phones off, please, if you haven't already, um, or on silent. Um, that would be great. Invariably, there's always one that seems to go off. Um, this session is being podcast. There will be time for questions towards the end. If you, uh, I'll pass around this mic, and if you could please hold it up as close as you can to your mouth when you're asking your questions so that we get the recording good. And, of course, um, there's a, a fantastic opportunity also after the session to come and meet the poets, buy their books, get them signed, and also perhaps go around and have a look at their poetry on the walls. So this year we have the poetry in the Granary Festival and everybody on stage, except for Steve, who's the editor of the Friday Poem, has a poem up on the wall. So, so you know, maybe you want to grab someone and take and go and have a photo with them with their poem. So I'm going to hand over to my wonderful uh, friend and colleague, Cliff Fell now to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, kua haere mai nei ki tēnei whare witi mō tō whakarongo i ngā kōrero e pei ana tēnei puka puka, the Friday poem, me ki te whakarongo i ngā kōrero o ēnei katuhituhi. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And so welcome to this uh, session, this Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talk session on uh, the Friday poem. Uh, we are, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here in the granary um, and um, to have these four writers here. Um, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have a. They're going to listen to. This. We're going to have a talk about what's been happening in New Zealand poetry, um, particularly since uh, the spin-off started under Steve Bronius started uh, publishing poems on their website and the, the changes that have been happening since then. Uh, but we're also. Um, I know that uh, here, Lindsay Bird wrote quite recently that. Uh, uh, nobody wants to listen to poets reading poems. People want to hear about people talking about poems, but but I think you probably want to hear the poets reading their poems as well. So so all three of the poets are going to read from their from their work as well. Um, uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, before that, I'm going to introduce um, the panel that we have here. Uh, Emma Neal is from Dunedin. She is the author of, she, she's the editor of Landfall, I should say, but, but she's much better known um, in her own right as a writer, both internationally and here at home. Uh, she's the author of six novels, and with To the Occupant, her latest collection of poetry, she's the author of, uh, she, is, uh, she has also written, published, six collections of poems now. Um, that's all since 1998, which seems to me a remarkable feat of sustained brilliance. Um, uh, we've got uh, Tay Tibble, is from Wellington. Uh, she is, uh, she whakapapas to Fano uh, Apanui and Nati Perot. Uh, she, um, 
studied history at Victoria University and then went on to do the MA in creative writing, in, I think, in 2017. And I burst onto the poetry scene uh, when she won the Adam Foundation Prize uh, that year. And I, th I think the folio then became, as I understand, her book came out in 2018 called Pocahanyatas, Pocahanyatas. And um, that went on to win um, the Jesse Mackay Prize for Best First Book of Poetry in uh, the Ockham Book Awards last, this year. Yeah, this year. Um, Chris Teeth is the author of two books of poems. The first, How, how, to, <laughs> how to Be Dead in a Year of Snakes, is that what it is? How to Be Dead in a Year of Snakes, it's a fantastic book. Um, came out in 2014, and he has, um, uh, since then, it's, it's, a kind of, it's, it's a narrative sequence uh, based around uh, the murder in 1905 of Joe Kum Jung, who, uh, and this is really the first recorded hate crime in New Zealand. He, um, uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. The, uh, his most recent book came out last year, is He's So Mask, um, and this has, come out to high acclaim, uh, was shortlisted for the, the Ockham Prize this year. I'm going to say, um, before I talk about the last one, uh, one of the things um, in this book, it kind of revisits his established themes um, of uh, race and identity, but with a far more personal take uh, on what it is to be a poet these days. Um, it's hard to pin Chris down for certain, though. He's a, he's a bit of a sort of shapeshifter, the poem's shapeshift on the page. And, and while, a poem like a, while a poem like Selfie with a Landscape opens, let's unpick what you think you know about me, what I've revealed, what I've left at the door of my favorite wolf. Um, serves notice that nothing is quite um, as it seems in these pages. Now that. That notion of the wolf, uh, this is why I wanted to just get that right, it kind of prowls through Chris's book, but it's, um, I don't know if it's a happy coincidence or, um, uh, or the close reading of Kerry who selected the poets, or whether uh, they're part of some sort of secretive cabal writing group. But, but um, the notion of the wolf um, is a common motif in all three of their books. Um, uh, in Tay's book, The Wolf Appears Early, Howling uh, to the Blue Corn Moon, and, and later in the high school playground poem uh, based uh, on the Twilight series. Needless to say, there are wolf werewolves running around the place everywhere. Um, it's a presiding, though, darker and more sinister presence in a poem titled Shame, in which a teacher wields male power in requiring the poems speaker, 16 years old, and clearly to be taken as the author um, to, to stay behind after class. In contrast, Emma has a very different, though equally kind of feminist, take on the wolf in one of her poems, a key poem, I think, um, actually titled Big Bad, the wolf takes on an unexpected female aspect emerging out of the poem's own skin, as it were to ask of us, the reader, essential and profound questions. Now, um, Steve Braunius um, needs no introduction from me, but he's going to get in one anyway. Um, warmth and humor of his writing are renowned. His observations on our cultural life, um, incredibly insightful, nigh on legendary. He's a columnist, as you know, reviewer, editor, and author. Now with the newsroom and New Zealand Herald still, I think, yep. But, um, but until recently, the spin-off. Um, thing about Steve, I feel he's just got this, such a capacious intelligence and intellect. Um, it's little surprise, surprise that uh, very few of the 
the organizations, the papers and journals that he's worked for have been able to contain him for long, uh, which is actually, I think, a great thing for us. Um, he's also the author of 10 books of nonfiction, ranging from bird watching to New Zealand crime scenes. But I suspect that of all um, literary endeavors, poetry has always been closest to his heart. And this anthology, um, the Friday poem, selected from poems he published in the three or so years that he was editor at the spin-off, at the spin-off's book page, is dazzling proof of this. So we're going to have a little sort of talk about about the book itself and this great moment, as Steve has described it, that um, has happened in New Zealand poetry, and then. Um, and then uh, we'll hear, hear the three poets reading. So, question for you, Steve. Um, in your introduction to the Friday poem, you say the book wouldn't have come about um, if it weren't for Hera Lindsay Bird. So obviously we're going to have to talk about Hera. But before we do, um, given that you as a young man, quite a few moons ago now, uh, accompanied Dennis Glover on... Uh, a one-day reading tour of Wellington and Palmerston North, and of course, invoking his immortal lines, I think of what may yet be seen in Johnsonville and Geraldine. And particularly as we have here in the person of Tay, somebody who, who lived, was brought up in Johnsonville, I believe. Um, uh, uh, what do you think, Steve Glover, would have would think about what's going on in the, country po in the current poetry scene? What would have delighted him? Would anything have surprised or bemused him? What would he ma have made of it all? Well, the first thing he would have been is completely drunk. <laughs> uh, he was a prodigious drinker. Uh, when I went to his house in Worser Bay in Wellington, and went into the kitchen. You couldn't see the other wall of the kitchen for the bottles that were lined, lined all up over the table. And they were all, bar none, completely empty. And they looked freshly empty, too. Didn't look as though this was the result of weeks. Nevertheless, um, he was continually, constantly drunk. And within that, he would uh, have the ability to retain reason and intellect and even genius. Uh, I thought his reading on that little tour we did over, I think it was a couple of days, uh, would lapse, almost lapse in and out of consciousness. Uh, sometimes it was just ridiculous and it was just an old drunk with a red nose. And other times it was this guy with an uh, unbelievably subtle uh, grasp of language and its nuances and its humour and he really reached out to an audience. Um, one of the things he did with his poetry is that he used very small words, uh, barely a poem there over one syllable. He liked the music of it and he wanted to appeal to people. He wanted for the poetry to be accessible and to be read by anyone, really. And I think that kind of uh, attitude would make him um, really take to this book. Uh, it's not especially monosyllabic, but definitely one of the pre prevailing philosophies I had with this book when I was putting it together, and indeed when I was selecting a poem every Friday at the spin-off, was to... Uh, I naturally gravitated towards poetry which um, I could understand and also think that other people could understand. Um, that did not mean that you were just tr trying to choose poems which were dumb and stupid and that a moron could understand, um, but would have really pleasing uh, effects to it, would have possibly a message, possibly say something about this country. Um, when I came to selecting the poems and I put them into sections, uh, there's one on love, for instance, there's one on old age. The biggest section, and this is indicative, were the poems about the New Zealand experience. 
you know, that sort of says something really, and I think it says something about pretty much all of us. What, what are our main sort of interests as New Zealanders? And I think we, because we live in this quite extraordinary but very contained country, we think about this damn place a hell of a lot of the time. And when we leave, we find out that no one else in the world gives a flying fuck about us. <laughs> it's kind of refreshing. But while we're here, we think real hard and real sensitively and real wittily about the place. And I think this is um, definitely a theme of, of, the, of the poems um, in here. Um, as I say, uh, as, you, as you say, started up this, this thing at the spin-off by selecting a new poem every Friday. And it didn't take very long before um, Hera Lindsay Bird occurred. Um, I, was looking, I was looking to publish new poets. Um, I was approaching people who I knew, like Sam Hunt, saying, I've started this thing, can you send me some poems? And they would, and that was great. And then I was thinking, well, the spin-off's got quite a young demographic. Who might be able to speak to them a bit better than Sam Hunt could? So I started reading around on the internet and various journals about who was writing, and I saw a reference to a poem by somebody I'd never heard of called Hera Lindsay Bird, and I loved the first line of the poem. Um, I absolutely loved it. I hated the rest of the poem. I thought it was boring. But the first line was like, this is, something's really new is going on. So I managed to track her down and say, I love that first line. Do you have... Uh, other poems that you might be kind enough to send to me, and she was very diffident and reluctant about it. But eventually she sent one in called Hate, and it was a sort of a litany of things that she hated. And it became funnier and funnier, and published it, and up until then, you know, you'd be lucky to get maybe 100, 200 people reading the poems. And without any advance warning or any kind of publicity or any Facebook stuff, likes, uh, it went off. And like within a day, 2,000 people had read this poem by an unknown poet. And she sent more in and they just became more and more popular. She wrote one about Monica, the character from Friends. And that went really crazy. It might have even have gone crazier if um, I sent it to... Um, the actress who plays Monica, on her Twitter account saying, hey, you want to check this poem out? Um, I really wish she had. That might have gone totally viral. And then she wrote one more, which uh, almost sort of broke the internet. Um, and that was just crazy. And uh, it was around about then that other people started coming along, other young poets who were also really fresh, Really interesting, really funny, too. This is the one thing about Hera, she's real funny. Um, and a lot of these poems had, had, they didn't have this one thing which uh, was making me reject uh, around about 60% of the poems which were coming my way. They didn't have the smell of the classroom. They didn't have the scent of, I'm writing something dutiful for some kind of teacher or my classmates. They just seemed to be coming out of the writer because they needed to write them. And this seemed to be coming out more and more often, and it was almost exclusively, uh, with one or two exceptions, and Chris is a shining one, with one or two exceptions, uh, they're mainly being written by young women. And a couple of years, two years or so passed, and then Tay Tibble started writing and read her work, and that's when I thought, ah, and enough is enough. I need to publish an anthology of this because I think something exciting is happening in New Zealand poetry. And I did wonder whether it was just me, but I, I had a chat with um, Ashley Young, who's an amazing poet herself and who is in this book. And um, she said, without me bringing, bringing the subject up, she said, oh, look, I really hope you do a book. Something is happening. And I thought, God, she just said the exact same words that have been on my mind for like months and months and months. I said, really, do you think? She said, yeah, you should do a book. Something is going on. And so I, I, I made a study of sort of anthologies of New Zealand poetry from the first one, which was published, I think, 1923, through the classics by Alan Kurnow in 1960 and Vincent O'Sullivan in the 80s. And um, wanting to see what other people did and what the prevailing attitude was. 
And there was one book, an anthology, which came out in 1970, and it was kind of the template for this one. It's called um, The Young New Zealand Poets, and it sort of introduced, really, um, this amazing generation of poets who were real young, not very well-known, uh, people like Bill Manhire, Ian Weardy, and Sam Hunt, like four or five others who've since become, you know, part of the establishment. And it's, even though it was written like, what is that, 50, 59 years ago, to read it now is like still real exciting. And you've got this sense that something is happening, or certainly was, you know, and, and that sort of attitude of exhilaration, of discovery, uh, that was the spirit which imbued uh, this particular book and uh, is the kind of uh, overall um, calculus, I think, which certainly these three fit into and pretty much all of them. I think it's, um, I mean, it was published a year ago, so I'm kind of like, you know, removed from it a little bit and also nostalgic. But whenever I see it around, I think, oh, that's a hell of a good book, you know? <laughs> Uh, you can, I can say that quite easily because I didn't write it. And I think um, there really was something going on. It was a year ago, um, and I, I see no reason to think that um, exciting, accessible, very New Zealand poetry is still not happening um, in abundance. And in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I read the latest one by Emma here in Spin Off, and that was the first poem I've seen since I was publishing them that I thought... Uh, actually, it wasn't the first. Uh, you did one a few weeks ago. Um, uh, I thought, God, that's, that's fantastic. You know, the, uh, uh, um, you know, there are certain forms of writing in this country which I think we are um, especially really good at. Uh, the short story and poetry, I, I would put in the top two or three. Yeah, well... Um Let's, uh, do you get a sense at Landfall, Emma, of this new poetics happening? Same kind of shift. Um, shift. I think that Landfall has a slightly different brief because it still has to have its um, sort of finger hold on tradition. <clears throat> so we kind of have an obligation to publish um, some of the more senior writers as well to give, to give the journal its, its link to tradition still. Um, but we also publish new writers. So it maybe doesn't have quite the same sort of... Um, feeling of upswell of youth <laughs> that, <laughs> that the spin-off did. And I'm, I'm sure that um, you know, online publication led to a much wider readership for the work that was being published, the poems that was being published on the spin-off. Um, and it did kind of get a, a, a sort of wider demographic than, than Landfall, which um, I still... I mean, that sounds as if I'm um, slightly talking down Landfall, but I think it just plays a different role. Um, and what I do see in the submissions pile is just a huge enthusiasm for creative writing in this country. And I think that <clears throat> partly creative writing courses contribute to that and contribute to the really high standard that we have. Um, and I do see more contributions from women now than, than from men, which is something that's been kind of happening slowly over time, I think. That's very much um, the point you make, Steve, that yeah. the ma majority of the writers in the, in the anthology are women. And that's a yeah. Yeah, picture. and if you compare yeah. that to Landfall in the '60s, it's completely different. You know, mm -hmm. the majority of the poems published were by men. I think one year there was, in fact, um, Fiona Farrell was talking about this in the Best New Zealand Poems for 2018. That in this, in '63 or '68, there were um, something like was it? It was something like 35 men and four women. I mean, it was a, it was yeah. a huge disparity anyway. Yeah. But the next issue of Landfall has actually got the numbers slightly reversed. We've got 29 women, 15 men, and one um, non-binary person. So it's well, that, That's like that book I was talking about, the Young New Zealand Poets, which we've got 20 poets uh, in it, and 19 of them are men. Phila McQueen's in there. Yeah. yeah. The one woman there, um, yeah. by the by, went completely insane. <laughs> As you were saying? <laughs> hey, so um, the internet's been a big part of this shift, uh, or, or certainly getting, getting you saw that uh, Keeps Us Dead, so Fuck Me From Behind went viral, and it must have been exciting to see that happen. Um, Chris, uh, do you, uh, I was wondering what, how you've you know, worked yourself 
the internet, trying to get your poems out there. Yeah. You... Um, I remember having like this own little uh, personal website. I guess you could kind of call it a blog, like back in the very early noughties. Um, and it was essentially just set up so that my friends and I could swap poems with each other. Um, so, you know, in a way, the internet became a way that we could do something like that. Um, and certainly for me, as a reader of poetry, the internet opened up so many sort of doors and um, for me to discover poets that I otherwise might not have stumbled across um, because I couldn't find them in New Zealand. And that really changed the way I read poetry and in turn wrote poetry. So for me, as a, as a reader, it was super important. And yeah, we were just talking about um, uh, these videos that I've made of, of, of me reading my own poems, and I think that's been a, another fantastic channel to be able to get your own work out there in a, in a, in a way that um, people that might not read poetry you know, might engage with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tay, have you got, you got a website, Tay? I'm not... No, I don't have a website. Um, it's coming, I'm sure. No, well done, I don't think so. it's nearly necessary. <laughs> Uh -huh. I don't, okay. I don't, because um, I, I do more mine through my like self promotion. I guess through social media. Okay. I'm big yeah. on Instagram and Twitter. Big on, okay. I like use that. You're an Insta um, poet, yeah, but, or not? No, I don't. No, I don't no, post any no, poems no, on Instagram. No, so yeah. that's my. But um, no, yeah, like social media has been huge for me with, yeah. with my work and getting it out there. And I um, also for other parts, I think of my generation, we're all we're all really connected online through our social media mm -hmm. um, platforms. And that's how we share our work and um, read each other's work. And <coughs> we're, I've been having discussions like quite recently with some of my um, creative uh, friends in, in Wellington talking about how uh, with social media now we, we don't, it's not, almost not necessary for us to use, uh, to go through mainstream media or um, things like that for our, to get our work out. I hear you're editing the next edition of Sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. So, and there's lots of new poets, new voices going to be in there. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's exciting. really exciting. Look forward to it. Hey, I think it's maybe time that we should um, listen to some poems. Um, you're going to read a poem from... Yeah, from yeah. Um, yeah I'll, I'll, and mind then, if I read a couple, just really quickly? Yeah, that would be, be great. So we're, we're going, folks, into the kind of poetry reading phase of the, uh, phase of the session now. Um, I like to read this one uh, it's by a guy in Dunedin. He's a communist down that way called Victor Billet. And um, his poem is quite indicative of a number of poems, including hearers, actually. Uh, they're written as a list. The lists seem to come off as a form uh, that influenced a lot of poets. And uh, it gets, uh, it's sort of a comedy, really, and it gets funny around about the time of the line, mid-career journalist. Uh, it's called Hierarchy. <clears throat> Invisible homeless, dead people, care worker, solo mother, loan shark, bottom feeder, dolt, casual employee, PhD in fine arts. Intern, experimental rodent, minion, surf, mid-career journalist. Ten years to go and holding on desperately. Climate scientist. Aspirational 30-something national voter. Embittered bureaucrat. Will never afford a house but still think they have a chance. Chief executive of 12 people. Tobacco lobbyist. Bishop of Destiny Church. Interior designer. Pea dealer. Change management consultant. Dairy farmer, backbone of the nation. Entrepreneur, all black, admiral of the whole damn fleet. God, been on <laughs> married at first sight, Vici. <laughs> uh, and this one is, um, I, I love this one. I, I, I was very keen to, um, to look at publishing uh, poet, uh, poet poems by people who were not uh, 20 or 30, but were in fact so old that they perhaps may have died. And I read about uh, the passing of a, po a poet uh, nearby here, uh, Gordon mm -hmm. Chalice of Golden Bay. 
And I read a little story about him, uh, sort of an obituary, and I thought, what an interesting chap. I wonder what his poetry was like. So I made a few calls, and his publisher sent in four poems, and I published a lot of them. I just thought they were amazing. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's got a love poem in here, which is uh, Sam Hunt described as one of the most beautiful love poems of the past 100 years, which I think is a pretty fair assessment. Uh, this one is more of a comedy, and it's called The Old. People over the age of 65 should be put to sleep for the winter. <laughs> no one will miss them, or if they do, any awkward questions to their friends or family are easily dealt with. Hired a camper van, went to Queensland, the World Cup. They would be woken in the spring as feisty and convincing as ever, telling how their absence was novel, exciting, hassle-free, and it went like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's lovely. Emma, do you want to read, will you read some of your poems from To the Occupant? I will. I'll, I'll start by reading one that, that appeared at the spin-off, um, on the Friday poem, and I, th <clears throat> I think it made it into the anthology. I actually can't quite remember now. Um, but it grew out of rereading um, Hansel and Gretel to my then five or six year old, and actually being more shaken by one particular detail as a parent than I was um, as a child myself. It's called The Belt. How could they ever love anyone else after what he had done? listened to that woman whose voice graunched like a spoon that tries to drag the pattern off the plate when even the broth scrapings are gone. Took them into the forest as if already the appetite of wolves was merely sleepy milk-time fable. Tied a dead branch loose against a tree so it tapped in the wind like the sound of his axe, mimic of love's vigilance laboring on, seeing clear into a shared future that it would build and warm, icy gaps under the doors barricaded, night fires singing like their lost blood mother after wine. But he had gone back to that other, to sup with her, they guessed, his mouth on her the way they had once glimpsed, like a dog knocking its bowl across the floor as it drank, the woman clutching along the mattress, the pale life loaf of her rising to him, their father dropping back as if he was her windfall plum, while the crackle and buzz of hunger in the children's heads turned them outside early to nibble on leaves, bark, even the boy's brown leather belt, which made them wonder and whisper about rumours of magic, for week by week the belt's dark, parched tongue lengthened when all else around them waned, marked by famine. And um, this next one kind of straddles that very thin beam between prose poetry and flash fiction, and it draws on a, a teenage memory of mine, but also lets fiction do a little bit of its redemptive work. <clears throat> and for audience members who prefer certain notes for, um, uh, content notes for certain subject matter, um, it does deal with sexual violence. It's called The Local Pool. Turn a corner into air tangy with chlorine. The smell removes memory's stopper and an anxious genie swims out. What about the turquoise of a small town pool? What about concrete dark with raw shark marks that wet bodies left behind after boys egged on and watched? Police phoned by a passerby. The next day, when their own girls cried, see ya, over pop radio falsetto, did the cops saloon door from their bathrooms, half scented with soap, then gruff up quick hugs, foam chins hooked over their daughters' shoulders to hide fuel lines of dread in their eyes? The mothers of the pool girls' friends, did they slash open packets, shove cupboards shut, slam on about hemlines and torn black tights, peep showing lucky pennies of skin, because grown women can't just wish link pinkies to ward off a suburb sons. The girl's friends asked by social workers to tell when she skipped classes because she had to get back on track, mustn't let one summer dusk haunt her with that boy crisping her open, 
peeling her back like the winding key on a tin of imported sweets? Did those friends stop reporting because tears scurred free as she begged, please don't? Or because they'd learned she'd agreed to meet the boy again at a bus shelter's cold bunker and the red folded mystery of how a wound could drag her back to its own start was too confusing. As disorienting as the acrid smoke they heard about later, when a school bag, school books, stockings, wasp-striped school tie were soaked in art room terps and set alight as a girl prayed for flame to leap a pine plantation's fire break, hive for the new subdivision and one blue house, its yard junked with bikes and a boy's outgrown clobber slung into trash bags, slumped like drunks. And I have um, two more poems for the allotted time slot. And this next one um, is a little bit longer. I wrote it for my paternal grandfather, Hamish Neal, who was born in Stoke in 1914 and um, raised in Whakatū, Nelson. Um, he eventually returned here and retired here. Um, and I actually found it quite hard to get through <coughs> this morning when I was practicing. So I'm going to stand, because sometimes that helps the waves to um, just go through. <laughs> it's called Morning Song. Gramps stole eggs, green seeds of song, from their nests to show us wonder. Hairline cracks ran our sooky hearts as we watched the robbed mothers fly home. He cradled fallen fledglings in his palm, quoted thrushes' eggs like little low heavens, and bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang, then barked, who wrote those, when we didn't know, what do they teach you these days? He kept army hours, was formal with our fathers, hellos were handshakes, as if manners meant even son's love should be hurled at arm's length. Yet, his face a white wilted poppy, he forbade the word hate, as yelled at brothers or sisters, over Yahtzee or Scrabble cheats, at garden hoses poked down trousers, or whose turn it was for more sucky chores. He had seen hate, had lived inside it, knew its cattle trucks, lice-run bunks, its thorn-crowned wires, borne its hunger over borders and weeks, stepped over its corpses to follow orders, eaten its soup afloat with leather threads and once a donkey's eye. Taken prisoner, he doctored the war interred, separated off the sick for hospital camps. Where the well was sent, he couldn't bear to say. All through his house and daily he whistled, morning has broken. Heard so often, blackbird has spoken, stopped meaning birdsong. It meant gramps and damp tea towels, thin coffee cups and saucers glazed with flowers that could be owls, owls that could be flowers. As in the Ghana novel, I doubt he ever read. His hours too crowded with the history books he scoured, still on the trail 50 years later for what drives human to its own dread perimeters. Praise for them springing fresh from the word meant tales of war turned, curtly turned down byways of jokes, witty anecdotes, for we were only the children of his children. There was no translation from lived to tale that could ever those random, horrifying odds that gave us all his sun-speckled kitchen, better not recount them. Better warble down the past's wind, mine is the sunlight, mine is the morning. We grinned, raised eyebrows at its no-fail return, praise with elation, praise every morning. The tune all whiskered trill, all roomy-eyed wink as he'd pop a dishcloth over his shoulder, a clown's epaulette, praise for the sweetness. But the baseline silence seeping, ominous his horizons blazing in the dark. We heard that too, the thrum of how our own luck shone. How improbable, the emaciated man, told by Nazi guards he would be shot at dawn, should have found this reprieve at all. Family banter in the kitchen, tea towels flicked like circus whips, retired GP, buffing crockery, fortissimo on key, even at home, smuggling single smokes up his cardigan sleeve, 
admitting nothing when they dropped at our feet, just cocking a blackbird's peck-quick eye, slipping the cigarette back up his cuff and whistling piercingly on. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of poems from Hisa Mask that also appeared um, as Friday poems. Um, so the first one is the one that uh, Cliff mentioned in the intro. This is called Selfie with Landscape. <coughs> Let's unpick what you think you know about me, what I've revealed, what I've left at the door of my favorite wolf to force eye contact the next time we pass in the street. These stories all had emergency exits, just like the rules adhered to by poets and liars that we've never thought to record for consistency's sake. Sometimes I look at my face in a mirror, and all I see is a bruised blanket of dusk settling on an increasingly unfamiliar terrain. I'm a man who lets trouble back into his life, even though I have raised every highway to and from that particular story. I'm both a short breath and an age expanding into minutes and days to be recycled as fact by other writers in 100 years. Will they give me weight to my failed desires, tell them I am no vessel for their designs, sticky nights forged into a vigil? Here's a true story. I cut my wolf out of my night scenes with a dull knife. He did not protest, and therein lies the pathos. Here's a status update. I cut my nails, and now I can't scratch at the dust caking over my eyes. I'll take a picture and show the world what I'm too scared to keep private. I just want them to like what I'm not. Oh, I got a mm. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, this next one, um, I read this a, a couple of months ago um, for National Poetry Day, an event that we did in Wellington called Show Ponies, where uh, a few of us poets pretended to be pop stars. So I read this with a black sequin jacket and a sequin cape um, and a smoke machine and very dramatic lightning, light lighting. Um, so today, I guess this is like the acoustic, stripped-down, intimate version. <laughs> this is called Chris Teese and his imaginary band. We were brighter when the world didn't know about us or our rock and roll dreams. Now we dress in black, but we're not depressed, we're just backlit, per record label instructions. Fans come and go, but true fans stick with you through the stigma of rib removal and that feud with Jim and the holograms. Nobody can win. Nowadays, the world is made of oysters and everyone's had a taste. Can I just say that I think I've done too many drugs? Or maybe it's gout? The bloggers won't stop reading into our matching tattoos. Yes, they're of each other's wives, but what's that got to do with the music? Everyone has forgotten we're an imaginary band. A suggested path back to relevancy. Nip slip, rehab ten trip, a greatest hits. It'll take an untimely death to seal our legend. No veins for overdose, no doomed flight. Buried by a mountain of French fries. That's how I want us all to go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought I'd just finish off with a couple of... Um, newer poems. Um, so before my first book came out, I was in a shared collection with two other poets, um, and it was called AUP New Poets 4. Um, New Poets 5 came out earlier this year, and we've been doing a few events um, to celebrate it and sort of getting some of the older new poets uh, together to do some events. So I've sort of been revisiting that selection of poems, and there's a poem in it called Stability, which I wrote about my great-grandfather and how he came to New Zealand. And it, it, that, that poem says a lot of the things that I'm still trying to uh, unravel in my own writing. Um, so this is, I guess, not, not a rewrite of that poem. It's a, it's a new poem um, that sort of borrows from that structure. Um, so this is called Stability Version. What you are is two boxes, checked with two fat ticks, but still not diverse enough, only history repeating in an auditorium too small for history lessons, so you think, you might be bold enough, smart enough, worthy enough, loved enough, in the middle enough, soft like an exposed belly, plenty to go on with making a small incision at the base of your spine to prove you're human enough, mature enough to buy a house, grow up, 
grow wiser, grow tall enough to reach the invitation on the top shelf, even though it feels like you're not Chinese enough, not Kiwi enough, not scared enough to say so, to say this can't be happening, shouldn't be happening, not under your watch, under your feet the worms don't think about whether they are early enough to miss the birds, satisfied in their place, enough, enough, hot enough, mask enough, fem enough, water running backwards on another planet, faith in a fair world restored enough, young enough, emerging from the ocean with a perfect beach body, not too far gone enough, kind enough to keep them close, mean enough to keep them wanting, and still you think your voice isn't loud enough to drown them out, not sharp enough to make them back down, a tidal song, a crowbar's reprieve, as great-grandson facing the same demons, as son, brother, lover, friend, doing your best to keep the mirror truthful. In all this time, all these years spent walking in the shadow of the past, you ask to keep present enough, stable enough to know you're making the right choices, the right noises, even when the empty box still misses your name, still tells you you're not enough. And so, what you are is a man looking to the past, asking to let it go and start anew. Mm, thank you. Um, and I'll finish off with this one uh, called Version Control. Um, I'm an editor um, in my day job, uh, so sometimes that sort of leaks into my poetry. You'll see. It has come to my attention that we have fucked things up. Not that we inherited the best bones to work with. Some broken a few too many times, others carelessly tossed into suitcases that no one will ever claim. It's 1616 and they're publicly burning us to ashes for sodomy. It's 1998 and they're beating, torturing and tying us to fences. It's 2019 and they're rediscovering old ways to race us. Each time we say it gets better or that we will learn from the past, we are setting ourselves up for failure, jinxed and cursed, a self-addressed envelope for a future that will never come to pass. This time is no different from the last times. In one version, we were golden, our nights sweetly perfumed by the sea breezes of our childhood holidays and apple crumble just out of the oven. We failed to mention that one year, a young boy's body washed ashore in non-accidental circumstances, and later, their oven was the cause of our house burning down. In another version, our days are drowned in blue screen light, electrifying our brains and keeping us up at night so we can stew in the unmistakable stench of bodies rotting under the floorboards. We buried our dead, but we didn't bury the causes of their deaths. We can't bury the lines between then now and now then, hoping that no one will notice they're missing or go looking for them. We can't be that fucking naive. We simply can't do that to ourselves. What we see now is a scab over the past. We pick, and what's underneath is waiting to stain us. Can't we just enjoy the myths? Go back to the first version to compare, track, and accept or reject. Excavate the goal that's still worth bleeding over, while the sky still speaks in blue, and the seas know their place for now. Tell me which version of the world you want to live in, the one in which the definition of a body is a loaded gun waiting to be shot, or the one in which the definition of hope is a meteorite passing over our heads and disappearing into the uncharted skies. Both are valid, but only one will let you sleep at night. Thank you. Mm. Chris, so Tay, you can read it. Mm -hmm. Your poems, please. Yeah. Um, firstly, I want to just say thank you to Kerry and um, for the festival and for Nelson for having me. Um, I'm born in Wellington. My mum was born in Wellington, but when she was about six years old, she moved to Nelson. She grew up here, and my grandparents live here out in Brightwater. Um, I spent many a summers here, and I do consider Nelson one of my homes. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> That's cheap. Um, this first poem I'm going to read is um, in the Friday poem. And it's called In the 1960s, An Influx of Māori Women. And it kind of speaks to a time uh, post-World War II when um, a lot of Māori women from up the East Coast, where I fuck a puppet to, moved to the cities um, to work. And that's sort of um, how my family came to be in Wellington. So, in the 1960s, an influx of Māori women moved to Tinakori Road in their printed mini dresses, grow flowers on white stone rooftops to put in their honeycomb vases, dust 
the pussy-shaped ashtray their husbands bought on vacation in Sydney, walk to Kokoldi and Staines while their husbands are at work, spend their monthly allowance on a mint green margarita mixer, buy makeup at Elizabeth Arden in the shade too pale pink, buy vodka and dirty magazines on the way home from the chemist, Hide the vodka and dirty magazines in the spare refrigerator in the basement. Telephone their favourite sister in Gisborne. Go out to dinner with their husbands and dance with his friends. Smile at the wives who refuse to kiss their ghost pink cheeks. Order dessert like pecan pie but never eat it. Eat two pieces of white bread in the kitchen with the light off. Slip into an apricot nylon nightgown freshly ordered off the catalogue. Keep quiet with their husbands' blue-veined arms corseting their waists. Remember the appointment that they made to get their hair fixed on Lampton Quay. Think about drowning themselves in the bathtub instead. Resurface with clean skin, then rinse and repeat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was really laughing at my voice. <laughs> that was funny, yeah. Um, Here's another poem from my nan. This poem's called um, Our Nan Lets Us Smoke Inside. Our nan lets us smoke inside, but only when we drink wine and play cards on the kitchen table. I feel glamorous when I drop my ash into the power shell in the middle. Our nan wears black leather pumps and dries wishbones from chicken carcasses in an empty margarine container on top of the fridge. And she's not my real nan, but I've always wished she was. I wished I was born with her, blood in my veins, her dark Waikato DNA, high cheekbones and heavy wet eyes just like my sister. Our nan met her late husband in the late 60s. She was dressed in a little mod dress, her black hair flipped and he was a cowboy with mutton chops and tan line legs and short cream shorts who rode off to work every morning with a commercial digger for a horse butt. He'd pick us up in his station wagon on Sundays, Johnny Cash and his metronome voice making us fall asleep against the dusty window so we would stop for a fillet of fish and a strawberry milkshake for lunch and for dinner, but he always picked my sister up more. At his funeral, us girls carried the mismatched flowers behind our brothers in black sunglasses. At the service, we all got up and sang, I hope you're dancing in the sky but it was painful and flat and sounded mostly like coughing. And during the burial, nobody exhaled a word as my nan ashed out a half-sucked cigarette in the fresh sour soil. And in the car park, we all smoked back tears with another cigarette pacifier, like babies numbed on a nicotine nipple. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'll just read one more. Uh, who here has read Twilight? This book. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should Oh, should I then? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm going to read it anyway. Well, Twilight is this uh, epic saga. <laughs> I don't know. About a vampire man named Edward Cullen, also known as Robert Patterson. He falls in love with a human girl and... They just brood a lot in a forest. I think that's the context needed for this poem. Um, But it talks about my experience growing up in a multicultural high school. Uh, It's called Vampires vs. Werewolves. What was it like to grow up during the twilight season? My high school was surrounded by pine trees and a dank fog from a student body of chain smokers. It was romantic. And in science, we didn't study mitosis, but the purple swimming pools on each other's necks. They sprouted spotty like hydrangeas out of navy V-neck sweaters. I grew up worrying that strangers could read my mind. Because I couldn't keep my thoughts clean or my head in, no one could. We were just two sides of the same hood, red and blue, white and black. And we had brown boys running around topless during PE and calling themselves the wolf pack and the white girls took them home to see if their parents would bear their teeth. 
So the boys were served up like hunks of raw meat, but at least they got to eat out at fancy restaurants and in bedrooms covered in posters from Cream and Dolly magazines. Well, I had Edward Cullen on my wall. And Taylor Lautner dated Taylor Swift, and Robert Patterson dated FKA Twigs, and I guess I see myself in her in the same way I see myself in the twigs on the ground, organic, snapped, brown, and brown reminds me of the leaves and the sausage roll wrappers in the gutters. Because we used to say gutted when something bad or funny sad happened. You left your phone in the bus, gutted. The teacher kept you in, gutted. Can't come to the party because to babysit your siblings or your mum is at housey, gutted. But I think we were trying to say gutted as if we felt as though our stomachs had been knived and emptied out. Because it's easy to be seen as the big bad wall, 14, chronically shy and anorexic, you make yourself sick with lusting. All you want is that pale sparkling on the television. It makes you do things out of character. At least it would if you had a character. That's why fingers end up down throats and upskirts and pointing in the wrong direction. It's the boy who cried wolf, but in reverse you cry sheep, and nobody believes you're bleating. They don't want to. And I remember once after swimming, a girl was sobbing because she was teased about the thick dark hair growing like a forest across her arms and her stomach. And now everybody draws their eyebrows on, just like hers. And it was sports day, but after that, the administration banned the girls from wearing crop tops and bikinis, but the boys still ran around in white fronts and purple acrylic paint. And the boys are running from their mothers and from the girls who looked like their mothers because you're just not exotic to people who look like you and you always want what you can't have. Edward Cullen only wanted Bella because he couldn't read her mind. That, and she smelt like wild strawberries or something. And he wouldn't have wanted her if she was like those other girls whose minds he was always sneering at but reading anyway, like a teen magazine or like a trashy book. Well... He was an angsty, stone-cold son of a bitch, always flaking on her, ignoring her, telling her to leave him alone. And then just like showing up in her bedroom, uninvited, in the middle of the night, watching her sleep, spying on her, and generally being weird and mean and obsessive. And all this was on top of constantly telling her how badly he wanted to suck the life from her already lifeless veins. Because we crave otherness and we hate otherness. And there was a boy who would meet another boy in the pine trees. But after accidentally making eye contact in the hallway, he put that boy's head through a school locker. And in twilight, the vampires and wolves made a pact to live in peace as long as they left each other alone. But then high school happened, and we liked the look of one another's teeth. Thank you. So, um... We've probably got two or three minutes uh, for questions, if anyone's got questions at all. Um, the microphone will come uh, brought to you. If not, we, if not, we might um, just have maybe one or two short poems. Um, anyone, anyone got a poem you'd like? And just for, any questions? Ah, oh, we have a question over here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Who was the question? Oh, that's um, me. Just wonderful. I just so enjoyed all your poems. I would like to know, where do you meet? Do you meet each other, you young poets? Where, where do you meet? Do you talk to each other? The internet. <laughs> the internet. <laughs> and I, I mean, with Tay and I being in Wellington, I guess we run into each other at like book launches and other literary events quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. On the timeline rather yeah. reading. There's no <laughs> secret club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I would just like to ask all of you, how does it feel to stand up and read your own poem? Would you prefer to do that than have somebody else read it for you? And, and do you find it difficult or, or do you find it quite an easy thing to do? That's, that's three questions in one, but you know, just how does it feel to, to read your own poems? Um, I prefer to hear other poets read their own work. 
you know, um, so, I mean, I, I, I do enjoy reading, but what I'm trying to say is I think that the, the poem and the poet are so closely um, embedded in each other that, that the voice of the poet definitely adds to the work, and so I've kind of learnt to enjoy it, um, if you see what I mean. I've trained myself to, to use the nerves and um, channel them in a different way. But, um, yeah, if I was given the option of reading one of the other poets' works or hearing them, I'd much rather hear, hear them do it themselves. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to, like, sound square because I'm really cool, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like... I, feel, I, I actually feel, like, quite honoured when I get to read my poems, especially in front of people. Like, I don't know, I like the reciprocity of it. And um, something that I always think about when I, when I go to read is something that Apinon and uh, Taylor told me, which is that you read your poems with the manner they deserve, and um, that way you honour the audience and you honour uh, the poem and you honour yourself. So I try and do it like, I don't know, I feel respectful. <laughs> um, I do get a little bit nervous sometimes, um, depending on the, the sort of event and what I might be planning to read. Um, there's, a, there's a poem in the anthology and in my book um, that's kind of like a love heartbreak poem, and I would normally have read that poem uh, today, but my mum and dad are in the audience, and I don't really want to do that in front of them. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I love reading um, in front of audience because you do get that sort of immediate energy back and it sort of feeds you as a, as a performer as well. Um, and sometimes some poems are really fun to, to read and, yeah, get out there. Okay. Well, any other questions there? Well, I think we'll bring it all to an end. That's just for me to say thank you to all of you. It's been fantastic hearing uh, you read your poems. Hearing you talk about the Friday poem, Steve, um, please join me in saying big thanks. Um, you're all going to be down on the, uh, the writer's table signing books, so, so please uh, come and talk to the poets. Ask them, uh, you, know, you can ask them, that's the chance to ask them about the little, little sort of nuances of the poem and deep, so, and all that stuff. And also, also I'd like to um, remind, actually, I just wanted to respond and say, of course I picked everyone because they wrote about wolves. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's a nice segue into the fact that um, Chris's poet, Wolf Spirit, Fade Out, is up the end here. And a reminder again, thanks, Yanya, um, that there's poetry from each of the poets on the walls. So go around and have a look and, and maybe you can get a photo with them. I'd like to take a photo of you with your poems. Um, I also want to thank uh, Paige and Blackmore for sponsoring this event. And also I want to acknowledge um, the publishers uh, behind these books. So Victoria University Press, Auckland University Press, Otago University Press, and of course, Luncheon Sausage Books, which brought out the Friday poem. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy chatting to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Cliff, sorry. Uh, thank you, Cliff. <laughs> You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival, Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka Talks.